I would like to begin this morning by sharing with you the word of faith. The word of faith is all that I intend to preach this morning, and I hope that it is seated in your heart and is able to change your life. The word of faith that we are preaching is, click it for us, reveal, space bar. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10 is our text today, and you can see that is where we have derived this phrase. And in verse 8, it is simply said, this is the word of faith which we are preaching. And so as we begin, I think maybe a question is in order. Do you believe that? Let me just rephrase by rereading. Do you believe that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved? Interesting question, probably a variety of answers. On the one hand, you just got to say yes. How could you not say yes? The text is telling us this is the gospel and we must believe it. But on the other hand, there is something in the back of your mind saying maybe the answer is not yes. Or at least it's like, um, yes, but... And I don't mean you're coming from some nefarious or ill-advised angle. It's just in the back of your mind is playing the things that Jesus said that are not in this verse. Jesus said that we must repent of the sin in our lives in order to be saved. I don't see that in this verse. Jesus said that we must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. That's not in that verse either. Jesus said we must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. No, no following in Romans 10 and verse 9. And, and Jesus said we must worship, big point of emphasis for us, in the truth. And none of that is referenced. So how could this verse actually be true when it seems like it's not true and there are other things? And probably what your concern is, is that if we just send this out all the way across Lindale, we just make little cards and we mail it out to everybody and we say, come to the Lindale Church of Christ where you can learn the word of faith. Confess and believe and be saved that we will send the wrong message. Maybe they'll think Lindale Church is a faith-only church. It's a church where all you have to do is believe and you're saved. Or all you have to do is open your mouth and say the name of Jesus and you are... Well, that is what the text says. But what if they believe that we believe that and miss some of the other implications of it? So you might be thinking, well, the answer is yes, but it needs some hedging. Well, you will probably not be impressed with the next four verses then. Because it's almost like the Apostle Paul goes out of his way to not only double down on this, but to triple down on it. Let me explain. In verse 9, it's like he's saying it slowly for those who can't quite grasp the language. He said, okay, check it out. With a heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then he breaks it down even further. The scripture says, Old Testament scripture, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call, confess, call on him. And then he says this, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Look, I'm not a super duper smart guy. And I haven't memorized all of Scripture, and I can't tell you everything about everything, but I can tell you this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are going to heaven. I believe that. Because he says it again in verse 10, and again in verse 11, and again in verse 12, and again in verse 13. But then we find ourselves in this pickle then. What about turning your life away from sin? 
What about being baptized for the remission of sin? What about living a faithful life? What about proper worship? Well, here is what I want to try and convince you of this morning. That all of that is not added to this. It's not this and all of that. All of that is included in this. Now, there's a stern statement coming. If you believe that Jesus is the resurrected Christ, then you will naturally and joyfully do everything that he tells you to do. But you say, okay, that was fine. That, okay, let me reverse it then. This is less comfortable. If I am not willing to do the things that Jesus said, then I do not truly believe in him. See, that's the way this text hits me. It's not, well, you need to believe and then you need to figure out all these other things you do. No, you believe and you're saved. But believing and confessing is more than just saying his name and being saved. It's confessing that he rules your life. Let me just ask you something. If Jesus rules your life, how many of the things Jesus taught are you going to do? You do all of them the best you can. But if you say, I have confessed Jesus as Lord of my life, but I'm not a Bible guy. I'm not a Jesus guy. I'm not a disciple guy. I'm just, I just confessed him and I'm saved. Then you have not confessed the name of the Lord Jesus. You've just said someone's name. And there's a big difference. Well, the question is, can I prove any of that? Now, in a sense, I can leave this text, which is not the ideal approach. We'll get around to the ideal, I think, approach in a moment. But I can leave this text and I can show it to you back in Acts 2. Would everyone go with me back to the day the church began? If, in fact, all that is necessary is a core belief and a vocalization and obedience isn't necessary and sacrifice isn't necessary, then we're going to see that in Acts 2 because that's the day the church began. However the church came to be and people started being saved, that is going to explain the gospel of faith. Now, a couple of things I want you to note. Acts 2.21, and we've talked about a lot of this before, uses the same verse from Romans 10 out of Joel. It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I 100% believe that. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you proclaim his name as Lord and believe in him. Verse 36, the sermon ends with, you need to know and believe that God made him Lord and Christ, ruler and savior, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. That's important. They were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? Now, here's where we get to test our theory. And we've seen a lot of this before. If you're visiting here, this may be new to you, but the members here have seen this many times before. As we get to verse 37, they have believed that Jesus is the Christ. So they're believing it. They're coming to believe it. And they have vocalized this concept of needing the Lord. Now, what did Peter tell them to do? Big surprise, Peter went to a Church of Christ manual book and read what it takes to get into a place that has a sign like this. There's no manual book. There's no doctrinal discourse or denominational direction. All Peter said is what Jesus said. You guys know Jesus is the one that's going to save you, right? Believing in Jesus is going to save you. Confessing the Lordship of Jesus is going to save you. So when they said, we believe and we're willing to confess it, what shall we do? Peter said, repent. Why did he say that? Because that's the first thing Jesus said. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Why did he say that? Because Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. They went on in verses 41 and 42 to continually devote themselves to give up their goods and their money and their time and their effort, their kitchens and their homes and their Saturdays and Sundays. They gave it all up because that's what Jesus said to do. That's what Jesus said. He said, you deny yourself now. You live for someone bigger than you, me. You live to serve someone outside of yourself, my church. And they did it. To me, Acts 2 is the easiest place to show that this is absolutely true. Please do not be one of those members of this church who says, I don't believe that. I don't believe that the word of faith is believe and confess and be saved. You better believe it. Because thrice in our text, Paul said it's true. The question is, can you explain the power of it? 
The next time, and this is kind of what I had written at the end of the lesson, but the next time somebody says, hey, I think that all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you can be saved. I'm going to say, me too. Let's go get to work. Me too. Let's go do what Jesus said. I believe that also. I believe that if you just say his name, then you will receive his grace. Me too. So let's go say it. Let's say it. He is Lord and Savior and guide and life and everything. Well, I don't know if I want to say it. Then you're, you're, just saying, you're just saying a word then, a name. Acts 2 is a beautiful place to help us understand our text. But I want to try to do something a little bit different this morning and I think a little bit better. Because a lot of times, if you go back to Romans 10, someone who you're talking to about this, who maybe doesn't believe that their works matter, Maybe they're raised in some kind of Calvinistic background and they can't get over this idea that, that baptism would be relevant or the need to actually obey is somehow going to matter in the end. And so they're clinging to a verse like this and they think it means you don't have to obey. It doesn't mean that. But when you say, hey, let's leave Romans 10 and let me take you over to Acts, you've kind of lost your audience. How many of you guys understand that when Rome, the churches in Rome got this letter, they didn't go reference Acts to check it? They didn't say, you know, when I measure that up against Ephesians chapter 3, they didn't have the book of Acts. They didn't have Ephesians. This is all that they had to try to figure out what this meant. So what I want to do with you for the last bit we have is I want to kind of show you what's really going on in Romans 10 itself. There's a major appeal to the Jewish people who were dispersed all throughout Rome trying to convince the Jews about the nature of the gospel, to change their religion for the, the proper religion. And Romans 10 is building that. So here's what we're going to do. I want everybody here in Romans 10, if you happen to have a marker or something, we need to leave it to go to one other place and kind of go back and forth a little bit. But as you'll see, it's proper to the text. Go to Romans 10. Let's pick up with what's going on. Verses 1 through 4. Romans 10, verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, for the Jews, is for them to be saved. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, you guys know what's going on? The Jews believed in God. They thought that keeping the law of Moses was the only way to be in a relationship with God. And they were willing to kill people to keep that going. They were militant about that. And he said, look, I can see that you have zeal, but you don't have knowledge. Now they would have taken insult to that because a Pharisee could have quoted the whole book of Deuteronomy in two languages. The idea that I don't have knowledge is an insult to me, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying you don't have knowledge and understanding that the old law was destined to be replaced by the law of Christ. That's what they're missing. That the old law, its entire purpose was to live for a while and then stop living. And all of that, that attention you were giving to it ought to be taken from it and given to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what verse 4 is saying. For Christ is, and the New American Standard says end. You may have even better wording. For Christ is the aim of the law. Christ is the direction of the law. The law of Moses is pointing to Christ. It's saying, everything you thought you loved about me, you need to turn and love him. Everything you felt about me, you need to now feel for him. He's trying to get them to see that one has been replaced with the other. Now, does the Bible talk about this? It does. There's some notes in the back today. There's no slides, but you have this all typed out and all the verse references are there. In Hebrews 8, just note for reference, the Hebrew writer said that the first covenant had become obsolete and it was ready to disappear and you needed to turn all of your attention towards that new covenant. Take all that passion and move it forward. Galatians 3, which we referenced in Bible class today, said that the old law was just a teacher. It taught you how to love. It taught you how to live and how to yearn. But it was a teacher that was preparing you to turn your attention to the word of Jesus. Now, we haven't really gotten to our point yet about verse 9, but I want you to understand that that's what this text is designed to do. It's designed to get the Jews to turn their passions to the right place. Now, pick up with me in verses 5 through 8. Let's get really close to our text. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. 
But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. I'm only going to pause for five seconds to say that what I'm about to read to you is an Old Testament quote. I mentioned that to you if you were in Bible class today, maybe your text has all caps or italics or indention. It says, hey, quote in the Old Testament here. But the righteousness based on faith, verse 5, speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth. And here it is. In your mouth, confess, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Now, after that, he's going to get into the gospel message. But he says, listen, Jewish people. You already kind of know what I'm talking about here. You ought to have an appreciation for what is happening beyond anyone else. Because back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, that's where these quotes are from, it all got spelled out for you. Back in Deuteronomy 30, you were told some things about the law that you knew mattered. But now you need to turn that towards Christ. So here's what I need you guys to do today. This is it as far as turning, I think. Be sure you can get back to Romans 10 whenever you need to. And then head all the way back to where these quotes originated in Deuteronomy 30. If we're going to understand what's going on in a text, we need to understand our audience and the points being made around the verse. And I think this will help. So I'm back in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and I'm reading in verses 11 through 14. This sounds very similar to Paul's point. He's borrowing on purpose. Verse 11, Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. For this commandment, law of Moses, right? Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. This commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. Now, I want you to note that. It's not out of reach. It's not up in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word is very near you. In fact, it's so close to you that it's actually in your mouth, on your tongue, and it's in your heart that you may observe it. Now, a couple of things here. First of all, you're already beginning to see that three times, if I've noted this right, Verse 12, end of the verse. Verse 13, end of the verse. Verse 14, end of the verse. Having the word in your heart means that you yearn to do what? I'll take off my coat and come down there. Don't make me do it. Observe it. Having it on your tongue means that I proclaim that I will do what? observe it, not just proclaim it. The Bible's awesome. I don't read it, but I think it's great. That's not this. This is the Bible's God's word and I want to observe it. And I'm not afraid to tell you that. You're already kind of beginning to see, but there's something kind of cool going on I want you to see first. He's appealing to the Jews. So don't worry about our text for a moment. He's saying, Jews, do you know how blessed you are? I got a question for you in a minute that's going to sound exactly like that. Do you know how blessed you are, Jewish people? that the word of God is not locked away somewhere in heaven so that you can't come near it? What if you had to get past this life into heaven to find out how to live this life? You'd never know how to live it. Aren't you glad it's not across the sea in some nation's library where you'd have to go fight a war in order to get it? I brought the word of God right to you and placed it in your heart. Are you thankful or are you not? That's not for you guys yet. The Jews said... We are so blessed to have the law of Moses that was brought right to us. Now, here's why that's important. I want you to note we have to go back to Deuteronomy 30 one more time. So mark it if you can. Head back over to Romans 10 because this is his initial point. His initial point is all of what you knew about Moses' law, it's time to transfer to Christ's law. And the first thing is you are incredibly blessed to even have it. The fact that it even exists for you is a miracle in and of itself. Look at the text again. Verse 6 of Matthew or of Romans chapter 10, verse 6. The righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, who will go up to heaven and bring down the Christ so that he can preach to me? Raise your hand if you're strong enough to do that, because I want to meet you. You're coming to my house for lunch. 
You can just go into heaven and grab the Son of God and bring Him down and have Him preach salvation to you. He said, no one is able to do that. But you know what? Christ came down anyway. You were powerless to go, so He came to you. Who will descend into the abyss, verse 7? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Who will go beyond death to get the gospel of resurrection and bring it back to us? Ethan, you cannot do it. We've got some great shepherds in the room who cannot do it. We are powerless to ever get God's word. If it was in heaven, we couldn't get there. If it was beyond death, it is in heaven and it is beyond death and you can't go. He said, just like with the law of Moses, though, Jesus actually brought it to you. Where did he bring it from? Two places. Where did he bring it from? He brought it from heaven. We built a tower once to try to get there. You guys know that? We didn't make it. He brought it down from heaven, and then he brought it back from where? From the grave. Two places you can't go. He brought it. And so the initial point is, Jews, remember how blessed you felt that you actually had the word brought to you? Because now even more so, the word of God has been brought to us. Not only did he bring it to us, verse 8, but he brought it near to us. He put it in your heart. I mean, think about that. The eternal word of salvation, the word of faith. He brought it to this world and wrote it down and put it in your heart. Your heart. And he put it on your tongue. Now, before we talk about what that means, can I just ask you, like, how thankful are you for that? How much does it mean to you that the gospel is in front of you today? That you know what heaven is like and how to get there. That you know what happens after you die and how to live again. Folks, if we don't get our gratitude meters pegging out on the right side, I don't know how we're ever going to be the Christians we ought to be. I don't know how we're going to get there. Gratitude and thankfulness. He's saying, Jews, remember how grateful you were back in that day? He said, verse 8, that is now the kind of passion you need to be turning towards the word of faith. I'm back in verse 8 now. That word is near. It's in your mouth, Romans 10 and 8. It's in your heart, the word of faith, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. He placed the gospel on your lips. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He placed the gospel in your heart. You will be saved. Now, what would that have meant to them? I, I just wonder, if I had a time machine, there's a lot of things I would do. But somewhere on that list might be to just go back and listen. I'm going to tell you, I would take a faith only person with me. That maybe I would do that. I'd say, hey, you got a minute? I'll get you back. It'll only be two seconds of your time. I want to take you back to a Jew and I want you to try to explain faith only to them. I'm going to take you back to a first century Christian and I want you to say, listen, all you have to do is believe. You don't really have to go to church. All you have to do is confess and say the name every once in a while. You don't have to be evangelistic, hospitable. You don't have to give anything because works don't matter. Works are irrelevant. All you have to, although confession is a work, but all you have to do is say it. And they said that to a Jew. A Jew would look at them. A Gentile Christian would look at them. A first century believer would look at them and say, what are you talking about? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And let me show it to you. I think you're going to find this neat. I want you back in Deuteronomy 30 one more time. Deuteronomy 30, I think you're going to see it right on the page. The next time, I need you to make a note of this. The next time you're having a Romans 10 conversation, you'll have a lot of Romans 10 conversations about this verse. What does this mean? Doesn't say anything about repentance. Doesn't say anything about baptism. Doesn't say anything about faithful worship. This is the way I'm saved. Please remember Deuteronomy 30. Say, hey, let me show you something. Paul was borrowing from the language that the passion the Jews had for the law now needed to be translated to the gospel. And the blessing that they had of having the law has been trumped by the blessing they have of the gospel. And here is their attitude about it. Go with me to Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. He said, the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart that you may observe it. Now let's read. I want you to read with me verses 15 through 18. Maybe the rest of the chapter. Let's see how it goes. See. I have set, tell me this doesn't sound like the gospel. I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. Now, if you were here for a lesson a couple of weeks ago, we talked about, am I going to be able to say it? Let me try it. Deuteronomistic, ah, I got it, views versus apocalyptical views. There we go. Under the old law, it was do what God says and live long on earth. 
Now it's do what God says and enjoy eternity. So the prosperity has changed. That's one thing we cannot deny. The prosperity is not physical now. It's better. It's, it's spiritual. But let's read it together. I won't stop this time. I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity in that I command you today. This is what's on your heart. This is what's on your lips. To love the Lord your God. To walk in his ways. And to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart, heart, right, belief, heart, if your heart turns away, what's that going to look like? Well, you won't obey. If your heart turns away and you will not obey, but you are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land, or for us it would be in eternity where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. This is the kind of law love that a Jew would have carried from Moses to the gospel of Christ. To have the gospel in their heart, look at it again, verse 16. To have the gospel of Jesus, to confess the name of Jesus from my tongue means that I love God, I walk in the ways of God, I seek to keep the commandments of God, the statutes of God, and the judgments of God. I want to observe the will of God. And a Jew would say that if you're not willing to read the Word and do what the Word says, we have so much of that today. I'm spiritual, not religious. Have you heard that term? I'm more spiritual, I'm a confessor and a believer, not so much a reader and a doer and a conformer. You do not believe. I'm not going to say, I know maybe some preachers would say, you believe, but no, you don't believe. You don't believe. You've not yet, can we talk because you've not yet confessed Jesus? A Jew and a Gentile in the first century knew that confessing Jesus meant giving your life to Jesus and his people and his church. And so back in our text, let me show you a couple of things here. Back in our text in Romans chapter 10, that's exactly what they would have taken from this. When they heard that now it's the word of faith we're so blessed to have, verse 8, and now I confess him as my Lord, the ruler of my life, and I believe that there's life after death. Could you imagine telling a Jew, look, you can live forever with Jesus, but you're going to have to be baptized in water to unite with his death. Would the Jews say, I don't do things, I just believe them. That statement wouldn't come out of the mouth of any first century believer. They would say, I believe in him more than anything in this life. And if baptism is how I unite with the power of his death, where is the water? That's what they'd have said. Sometimes we borrow our New Testament ideologies and we try to stick them back here in this place. And, and by the way, if you would look with me at just really quickly at Romans 1 and Romans 16, we talk about this a lot, but I think it is important. There's a phrase called obedience of faith that's found at the beginning and at the end of the Roman letter. The letter begins, Romans 1, 5, that grace and apostleship bring about not belief only, not occasionally go to church or something, not I read my Bible once. The grace of God brings about obedience from faith. You cannot separate the two. You can't separate the two. Nobody would have separated the two. And again, at the end of the letter in Romans chapter 16, how does the letter end? I was just reading it this morning. If you're doing our daily Bible read, if you'd like to join our daily Bible read, the sheets are right there on the back. And guess what today's read was? Anybody know? Romans 16, like right here. And in Romans chapter, unless I'm a day behind, but to me it was Romans 16. In Romans 16 and verse 25, now to him who is, this is the way the letter ends. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which had been kept in secret for so long, but now it's being manifested by the scriptures, Old Testament. That's what we're saying today. The Old Testament prepared you for this. According to the commandment of the eternal God, having been made known to all the nations, leading to what? Obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, before we close, though, I've got to do something else. Because we commonly overplay our hands. And if I do this right, sometimes I know I'm getting close to the truth when I aggravate everyone. If you only aggravate half the room, you probably aren't where you need to be. 
So if you walked in the room today and you're a grace only person, you're a God's going to handle it and don't have to do the church thing, don't need to be involved thing, don't actually have to read the word thing. Jesus is just going to come make it all work out. I hope you're aggravated in that belief because that can help stir your heart to actually live the gospel that you proclaim with your lips. But it bodes a very interesting outcome and question for me. If, if they were to transfer old law thinking, keep the law or else, to the new law, then why do we even try? If all that's changed is, under the Old Testament, you had to do what he said or die, and now the law is, you got to do what he said or die, what's going to happen to us? We're all going to die. I mean, you changed the law from OT to NT. Got it. Okay, but I still can't keep it. I'm still not good enough. So if the message here is obedience or else, I'm coming down with else. But here's the really cool part. You guys, this is the best part. I know I got to rush it, but this is the best part. There is a huge difference between the old law and the new law. Even bigger probably than natural reward being replaced with spiritual reward. You say it can't get any bigger than that. It, it can. And it's found in our text. Go to Romans 10. Here's the point of all of this. Romans 10 verse 3 mentions God's righteousness. Are you familiar with God's righteousness? God's righteousness is the goodness of God that you don't have. You can't have it. We're told in Romans 3, on your best day, with your best effort, there is none righteous, not even one. Now, under the old law, you still had to try and be good enough, even though you never could. And so that's kind of the big problem. Look in Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Under the law of Moses, the big problem was you had to build your righteousness case. And it was always crumbling when you came before the judge. If what we're trying to do in Christ is build our righteousness case through a different kind of obedience, then all of us are going to burn and there's no salvation for anyone. But here's the best thing about it. If we believe this, and it lives in our hearts and mouths and lives, we are not trying to establish our own righteousness. We are offering ourselves over to God's righteousness. Man, can I have another 30 minutes? Would you just somebody just nod? No one? This is the best. The, the deal is, verse verse. 4, five and six in this whole text. For Moses writes that a man who practices the righteousness by the law has to live right by it. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Here's what he's saying. If you will trust God, listen carefully, and you will do everything you can to obey Jesus. I told you already, you can't throw that out. I will put my righteousness on you. That's amazing. God will see you as righteous as he is. You say, that's impossible. No, that's the gospel. I know it's impossible. That's what makes the gospel so great. I will see you as holy, though you are not holy, just because you have yearned for a relationship with Jesus. Now, let me ask you something. You say, okay, now I did it. I aggravated the law keepers in the room who said, ah, we, maybe we talk too much about grace and maybe too much about God's righteousness and just get out there and get it done and you'll be fine. You will not get out there and get it done and you will not be fine. We're not doing this to earn anything. We're doing it so that God will place upon us a grace that we do not deserve. Now you say, Chris, be careful. You need to stop this sermon because you're going to convince people that they can go out and live however and God's righteousness will be upon them. Please don't insult me or yourself. If you knew that God would give you access to being seen and known as righteous as he is, that he would see you as pure as the son of God, would you obey a God like that or not? Would you be at worship to praise the name of a God who has decided not to see you as you are, but as he is? Don't you get it? Grace spurs faith. It is because of God seeing me this way that I seek to serve him. And it creates this great like back and forth, doesn't it? 
Uh, let me show it to you. You say, I don't know. I'm not really buying all that. Well, go to Romans 3 then. Go to Romans 3 and I'll show it to you as we wrap this up. Romans 3. Romans 3 is about righteousness, but it's not yours. You don't have any. You can keep the law of God very, very well and you still won't have any. That's the point. The gospel of grace. And in Romans 3, here's what the Bible says in verse 21. But now apart from the law, apart from the law of Moses, the righteousness, of, and really all law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being told to us in the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You have faith in him, you seek to serve him, and it's his righteousness for all those who believe. For there's no distinction because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Being, verse 24, notice this, Romans 3, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was, one more sentence, this was to demonstrate not your righteousness, are you kidding me? Yours? The whole reason we come to Jesus is because we don't have any. He says in this text, it was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. It is his righteousness offered to you. And that's the big difference between the old law and the new. The old law, you were thankful to have it. The new law, we're thankful to have it. The old law had to burn in your heart and come out of your mouth in the new law has to burn in your heart and come out of your mouth. The old law, I'm trying to observe it and keep it and honor God through obedience. In the new law, you're trying to observe it and keep it and honor God through obedient faith. But here's the difference. Old law, we're keeping a resume of your righteousness. New law, only God's righteousness is in view. And that's got to make you smile. Not mine. Not my record. Not my ups and downs. Nope. All of that has been taken away and replaced with the righteousness from the Lord. Uh, I was talking to Tony about this. We text about stuff. Matthew 6, 33. Who knows that? Seek ye first. Let me, let me know if I got this right. Seek ye first your righteousness. Is that what it says? Seek first his righteousness. I want his righteousness. I want his imputed is a word we use. I want his goodness laid upon me. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and God will take care of everything. That's the most comforting and hopeful and beautiful message that I can give you today. We sang the song, My, uh, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less was the first line. It was called something else. But the line is, and I heard you all sing it. I was listening. I got you on tape. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. If that's not the best thing you've heard all week, I mean, the week just started. It should be top 10 at least. That's the best thing anybody could ever tell you. You will stand before the Lord on His righteousness without even a single fault attached to you. How? How does that work? Let's finish in Romans 10. How does it work? I want that. I need that. Nothing else matters more than that. Then the Word must be in your heart and mouth you confess him as Lord. You believe in him as the resurrected Lord of your life. And he will save you, though you do not deserve it. That is the gospel. He says in verse 12, by the way, you're thinking, maybe not me, though. I'm closing up my notes. Maybe, maybe not me, though. May I, you don't know what I have done. I will never be. How many people have almost been baptized, but they're waiting until they're good enough? You ever heard that? You know, I just don't know that I'm good enough. I know I need to be baptized. Jesus told me to be baptized and I can't confess the name of the Lord without obeying in baptism. But I got a lot of things that I've got to work out and I carry a lot of guilt. If you're waiting to be good enough to be made righteous by God, you will never be made righteous by God. But watch this. There is no distinction. I don't care what you are nationality-wise, Jew and Greek. You can be single or married. You can be the best or the worst. The same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. I can't even tell you what all those riches are, but I want every single one of them. 
I want them. I don't earn them. I can't buy them. I want them. God offers them freely for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. But don't make it some hollow call, some wordage that's supposed to replace faith. The righteousness of God is placed upon everyone who lives by faith. The gospel message is for you today, and I hope that you will receive it. God wants to make you better than you are. He wants to take you further than you deserve to go, and he wants to give you more than you could ever imagine. And he will do so for all who believe and confess. Is it your moment? Is it your time? And do you understand what it means? And are you willing to do it because you believe in him? That opportunity is yours. Don't miss it. As together we stand and sing. Free